Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. Since current events have reintroduced the abortion issue to the Supreme Court yet again, we thought our two-part series on the rise and fall of Roe v. Wade would be a good thing to share. For the first time, if you're newer to the show, or to refresh you if you're a longer-time listener, we released these episodes about a year ago, in January 2021, so you'll hear us talk about the ongoing saga of the presidential election, January 6th. Feels like a million years ago, but it was actually one, and our sense of time <laughs> has been stretched and distorted by <laughs> what some might call an absentee god. <laughs> I often wonder if uh, at some point in time I, I died and went to some sort of liminal space between life and death. Yeah, mm -hmm. where you're still processing 2019. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What's that movie, Jacob's Ladder? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm in Jacob's Ladder. Okay, yeah. so this is now an intervention for Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Michael, do you remember what you did in 2019? Because perhaps you're still being punished. I think I started a podcast. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> the ultimate sin. <laughs> so since we released this episode, states have undertaken plenty of attempts to restrict abortion rights even before these really important Supreme Court decisions come down. So, for example... Idaho, Oklahoma, and South Carolina enacted these so-called heartbeat bans. Kentucky and Kansas passed laws to amend their state constitutions to say there is no constitutional right to abortion. New Hampshire passed a 24-week abortion ban. Louisiana passed a law requiring judicial consent for minors seeking abortion, minors who don't have parental consent. And the Supreme Court heard arguments in the suit against Mississippi's 15-week ban, which will probably be the case, very likely be the case, that overturns Roe and allows all of these, you know, currently unconstitutional laws to take full effect. And that's to say nothing of SB8 from Texas. Texas passed a near total ban on abortion, gave private citizens the right of enforcement, basically created this bounty law on abortion providers and people seeking abortion services. And, you know, despite some positive lower court rulings initially, as of this recording, you still cannot get an abortion after about six weeks in Texas. And the Supreme Court has more or less let SB 8, at least temporarily, stand. We made the Roe v. Wade episode because we, of course, like everyone else who's paying attention, sensed the impending danger to the case and wanted to A, lay out a little bit of the history and B, put out our thesis, which is that Roe v. Wade was correctly decided and the conservative legal movement found in the Roe decision a jumping off point for establishing its stranglehold on the American judiciary. Yeah. So whether the Dobbs case, that's the Mississippi 15 week ban, whether that officially or explicitly overturns Roe or they might do something like change the point of viability legally to 15 weeks, mm -hmm. Roe and the substantive right to an abortion are absolutely in danger this year. And I think it's important that people know the sort of history of how we got to this point. Yeah, that's right. You know, the one thing I want to say about this episode of 5 to 4 is that it was a good first step for us in articulating a defense of abortion rights under the Constitution. Yeah. Which is something that I think the left has sort of slept on a bit because Roe was always there. And, you know, until just a couple of years ago, it seemed unlikely that Roe would go away, at least in full. And once it is struck down, then we are put into a position where we need to be able to cleanly and concisely articulate why we believe this right exists in the Constitution. I don't think liberals and the left have done that successfully. And I think it, more importantly, can be done and should be done. And it is the natural first step once Roe is overturned or decimated or whatever the fuck they do. That's right. Right. You know, you said that the left and liberals have kind of slept on this issue, but I'd go even further and say that a lot of them have hampered the cause that you know, there's been uh, decades of what I would call legal uh, concern trolling about the rationale behind Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. whether it should have been decided under the Equal Protection Clause instead of how it was decided, and basically criticized the decision. And hopefully this episode is a useful corrective 
to that thinking, which we think is misguided. Yeah. So happy new year. <laughs> and uh, sorry about all this. It's not our fault. <laughs> Enjoy the episode. We'll hear arguments in number 18, uh, Roe against uh, Wade. Hey, everyone. This is Leon from Fiasco and Prologue Projects. On today's episode of 5 to 4, Peter, Rhiannon, and Michael are talking about Roe v. Wade. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. In two related cases and eight separate opinions, the nine justices made abortion largely a private matter and ordered the states to make no laws forbidding it, except possibly during the final months. This is the first episode of a two-part series in which the hosts examine the legal right to have an abortion, how it came to be, how it rallied the conservative movement, and how it has been gutted by the courts. We're seeing the true colors of the anti-abortion movement. For years, they have chipped away at the right to abortion, passing restriction on top of restriction, pushing abortion care slowly out of reach for many people. This is 5 to 4, a podcast about how much the Supreme Court sucks. Welcome to 5 to 4, where we dissect and analyze the Supreme Court cases that have caused our civil liberties to disappear like Amelia Earhart over the Pacific. <laughs> I am yes. Peter. Yeah. I'm here with Michael. Hey, everybody. And Rhiannon. Hi. Hi, everyone. I like to think of the Supreme Court as like a Bermuda Triangle for your civil rights. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. Your right to vote last seen flying somewhere near John Roberts. <laughs> yeah. Listen, considering the subject matter of this episode, I'm just relieved, honestly, that the metaphor was not an abortion metaphor. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for your restraint. Yeah, there. you're welcome. That, that's part two. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a happy new year, guys. First episode of 2021. Yeah. And whoa, so far, whoa. only one violent coup attempt. Uh, so <laughs> going great, I think. How are you guys doing? Oh, God. Yeah. I don't feel anymore. Yeah. I perceive, but I mm -hmm. don't feel. Right. <laughs> we might have to update that before we, <laughs> we publish. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, might be another coup yeah, that, <laughs> this coming week. You can't rule it out. That's true. <laughs> there is some demonstration planned, I think, the day before inauguration. So get excited. Yeah. Great. You know those yeah. signs that are like days since the last accident at a workplace? Right. Uh, we can just pop right. one up at the Capitol. Days <laughs> since the last coup. <laughs> Love to live in a failed state, baby. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the long-awaited abortion episode. And more specifically, this is part one of our two-part series on the rise and fall of Roe v. Wade. Most of our episodes are us criticizing a case, but that's not what we're doing today. Today we are telling a story about how Roe v. Wade gave rise to a right-wing reaction that has left a deep imprint on modern law and modern politics. Uh, Roe v. Wade found a constitutional right to abortion in 1973. And now, in 2021, multiple states have only a single clinic left. And this is sort of the story of how that happened, uh, not as the result of popular will, but as the output of a concerted legal strategy designed by conservatives and endorsed by the right wing of the Supreme Court to limit the availability of abortion services in this country. And moreover, it's the story of how the conservative legal movement weaponized Roe to champion its reactionary view of the law. Yeah, just to say, I feel like maybe our usual episode is like criticizing one case and um, we don't so much have that here. But worry not, the Supreme Court still sucks. That's right. And the story of Roe, even if Roe v. Wade is not a case specifically that we drag through the mud, the story is still very much about how the Supreme Court is uh, is awful. And, and also... If you're a liberal law student who is like, oh, I know how this episode's going to go. They're going to say it was poorly reasoned or it was badly written or whatever. Wrong, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned, buddy. <laughs> we like Roe v. Wade. <laughs> we do. Uh, we often speak on this podcast about the disingenuousness of the conservative legal movement because they claim that they are simply concerned with like the correct interpretation of the law. And in reality, they are driven by their right wing politics. And Roe v. Wade is a great example of that. Conservatives claim to believe that it was a bad decision because it improperly interpreted the Constitution. And they've even successfully convinced many liberals that that is the case. 
Yeah. But yeah. that's not why they think it was a bad decision, we assure you. They think it was a bad decision <laughs> because they are anti-abortion. That's and right. it's important when thinking about this case to understand the conservative psyche in the early 1970s. Roe comes on the tail end of 20 years of seminal wins for the left at the Supreme Court, from the end of segregation to the protection of civil rights. And that wave of rulings also included the development of rights to personal privacy, which encompassed contraception, and then in Roe v. Wade itself, abortion. And Roe is sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back for conservatives and really drives a narrative that there are like these liberal activist judges who are lording over all of us and making the law. A narrative that is still very influential today and continues to provide a frame for the ideological position of right wing jurisprudence. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, and the conservative response to Roe was to organize. Yeah, they rallied politically around anti-abortion sentiment. Uh, helping create the foundations of the modern Republican coalition. And they rallied intellectually around a conservative view of the law. The liberal Supreme Court of the 50s, 60s, and early 70s understood, you know, the Constitution is a document that can be read flexibly and is something that we should see to protect citizens' rights. Right. But instead, the conservatives reacted by strategically embracing, like, this rigid, inflexible vision of the Constitution which gave them a framework to reject not just abortion rights, but progressive goals entirely. (laughs) Right. And then they use that framework to portray Roe v. Wade as incorrectly decided and have spent nearly 50 years gaslighting us all about it. Right. And tearing (laughs) at Roe v. Wade's foundations. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So like I mentioned, this is going to be a two-part episode. And today we're talking about Roe v. Wade and how it came to be how conservatives reacted to it and how that sort of shaped the conservative legal mind. And we thought it was worth a two-part episode because there's another part of the story, which is how they have responded in the courts. And that'll be part two when we tackle Planned Parenthood v. Casey and the subsequent cases after that up to uh, the modern Supreme Court. Yeah, that's right. Another thing uh, that I just want to note up top is that throughout this episode and the next one, the second part of our abortion extravaganza, we will be talking about, quote unquote, women's right to choose and women getting abortions. Uh, We'll be talking about laws affecting pregnant women and mothers. But we should say, of course, that it's important to recognize that women are not the only people able to get pregnant or need full access to reproductive health care. Any discussion about reproductive rights is fundamentally, it's necessarily about trans rights too. So we will be parroting a lot of this kind of gender essentialist language because that's how the Supreme Court and everyone was talking about it at the time. And also, like, in doing that, we can hopefully be highlighting throughout the discussion in both of these episodes how these, like, really patriarchal and limited conceptions of gender are exactly one of the problems with these decisions. That's right. right. So before we get into Roe here, let's set the stage a little bit. To understand why conservatives got so upset by Roe, you need to understand some of the legal history. The 14th Amendment has a clause that says that no state shall, quote, deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Obviously, that's a slightly vague clause, and many scholars and judges historically read it in different ways. The court has largely read it to be less of a procedural protection and more of a substantive protection that protects people's liberty. Because of that, it's been referred to as the substantive due process clause. And the basic idea is that certain rights are fundamental to our liberty and therefore should be protected under the Constitution. The first time it was consistently applied by the Supreme Court was in the early 1900s when the court said that it protected the rights of citizens to enter into contracts with one another. (laughs) Uh, That was what was referred to as the Lochner era, named after the case Lochner v. New York, and resulted in widespread exploitation of workers by their employers until the case was overturned in 1937. Right. But you don't think uh, seven year olds have the right to enter into a contract with Tyson <laughs> Foods to work 14 hours a day for $3 an hour? 
that was the gist of it. <laughs> Their little fingers are perfect for the machinery. Hello. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Think about all the money you can save if you make the machines like a third of their current size. That's right. Plus you save ink with their tiny signatures. (laughs) So, you know, it's important to note that the general idea that the 14th Amendment protects these basic liberties is fairly agreed upon at the point of like the mid-century. That is to say that there is more or less academic agreement that the 14th Amendment protects rights that are not explicitly laid out in the Constitution. Yeah, that's right. And and the next time this comes up, the substantive due process clause of the 14th Amendment um, sort of takes center stage is in 1965 in a case called Griswold v. Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And in that case, the court held that the 14th Amendment protected the ability of a married person to buy and use contraception. Right. And and it said, you know, people have a right to privacy, and that right prevents the government from intruding on their private choices, including the use of contraception. Mm -hmm. And there's no explicit right to privacy in the Constitution, right? There isn't some amendment you can't remember right now (laughs) that says that. (laughs) But the court says, look, the 14th Amendment protects citizens' liberty, And if you look across the other amendments, it's clear that part of that liberty includes the right to privacy. You know, it's in the First Amendment. The government can tell you what to say or how to worship. It's in the Third Amendment. They can't come into your home. The Fourth Amendment. They can't search your house or your person. It's like underneath all that is this like idea of your autonomous zone around you that that belongs to you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the court says, look, that can't be readily infringed by the government. So even though the right to privacy is like not explicitly there, it's implied by the Constitution's protection of liberty and other provisions of the Bill of Rights. And and this train of thinking was going on through a bunch of their decisions in the 60s as well. It underlied Miranda. It underlied some cases about the right against self-incrimination. The court was like very interested in this like sort of small L libertarian idea about the government staying out of your shit, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the idea broadly is that, you know, you have this constitutional right to make decisions in your personal life that just affect you and the government doesn't have the ability to intrude on that. Yeah. And a couple of years later, the court strikes down a ban on interracial marriage in Loving v. Virginia, primarily on the grounds that it violated the Equal Protection Clause, but also that it violated the same 14th Amendment Substantive Due Process Clause, holding that the right to freely marry, similar to the right to privacy, is a right that's fundamental to your liberty. So that's sort of a very short version of where we are when we get to Roe v. Wade in 1973. Yeah, yeah. So to shift a little bit and um, start talking about women's access to full reproductive health care and just kind of abortion laws at this time in the early 70s. If we did a survey like across the United States, 30 states, including Texas, had blanket bans on abortions. Um, So they prohibited doctors from performing abortions completely unless it was necessary to save the mother's life. Um, And these laws had basically been in place since the mid 1800s. Some other states at this time had started to change their laws to permit abortions in more specific circumstances, such as when pregnancy endangered the woman's health, if the pregnancy was caused by rape, for instance, or if the fetus had a, a very severe defect. But otherwise, abortion is by and large prohibited. So, of course, this didn't stop people from seeking out abortion care or trying to terminate pregnancies on their own. Scholars and historians estimate that before Roe v. Wade, between 20 and 25 percent of pregnancies in the U.S. ended in abortion. So there were some licensed providers in big cities that you could have access to if you had the resources at the time. And there were underground networks of non-licensed abortion providers. But much of the time, if you found yourself uh, pregnant and you wanted to terminate that pregnancy, you were on your own. Actually, a Washington Post series in 1966 covered how women in the Washington area obtained illegal abortions. And some of the language in that series highlights, like, on the one hand, what a grave risk it was to get an abortion at that time. But on the other hand, how widespread the practice was nonetheless. So this article says, quote, humiliation, agony and the risk of sterility or death do not deter American women from ending an average of one out of every five pregnancies by abortion. 
going back to the point about having some access to a safer procedure if you were wealthy, this same Washington Post piece discusses the process for basically like getting psychiatrists to write up false justifications for why a woman needs an abortion. And then you would take that paperwork to a gynecologist and you sort of wink and nudge and uh, then the gynecologist would perform the abortion. The cost in 1966 for that whole sort of hoop jumping procedure was six hundred dollars. Uh, which in today's money is almost $5,000. So just wanting to highlight the role that uh, geography and wealth played in people's access to reproductive freedom and reproductive choice and safety back then. And note that here we are 60 years later, and we are kind of back at that point where geography and wealth play this really big role in people's access to reproductive health care. Um, We should also talk a little bit about what the Supreme Court looks like in the early 1970s. So Chief Justice at the time is Warren Burger. We have talked about him before. Uh, Not smart. Dumb guy. (laughs) (laughs) Unimpressive. (laughs) And he assigns the Roe versus Wade decision to Justice Blackmun. There's a majority consensus on the court among the justices that all out prohibitions on abortion, like the one in Texas, they are yeah, probably an infringement on individual rights, but no one wants to put their name on this decision. And Justice Harry Blackman is new on the court as of the early 1970s. So he's just kind of like the rookie who gets assigned this decision that nobody wants to write because it's complicated and it's lady stuff. Like, who gives a fuck about that? Yeah. So no one at the time on the Supreme Court, none of the justices think that Roe v. Wade is going to be a massive decision that has sort of wide ranging effects. But Justice Blackman has a background in working with doctors. So before he was a judge, he worked as general counsel to the Mayo Clinic for many years. And so, you know, Blackman sort of takes doctors and medical science seriously. There's a a liberal belief at the time among the justices, a belief in medical authority and deferring to it. And um, so just want to note that that you see throughout the Roe v. Wade decision, Blackman referring to, you know, this choice that's made between a woman and her doctor and um, talking about how the state shouldn't really be in that zone. Now, moving to the people at the center of Roe versus Wade, the plaintiff herself and um, the lawyers. So there are these two women, Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington. They're both law grads from the University of Texas, and they both struggled to find work as lawyers after they graduated. In Texas at the time, in the mid-late 60s, like you had to have the backing of a man to get a fucking apartment. Right. So uh, it's not like you just graduated from law school as Financial a Financial backing or just like a thumbs up? You had to have like a letter <laughs> of recommendation. God. Mm-hmm. And I would do that for any female listener of our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what it comes to, you never know with this court. I'm just saying. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome, ladies. <laughs> like I said, we're back to the late 1960s in a lot of ways. <laughs> So um, by 1970, Sarah Weddington had come to work with a group of law students and grad students in Austin who were looking for ways to challenge abortion prohibitions across the country. And Weddington called Linda Coffey, asking her to join on the project. A month later, Coffey got a referral for a potential plaintiff from a lawyer friend who did family law and adoptions. And he told Coffey that a woman had come into his office seeking a referral for abortion services legal or illegal, that, you know, she was unhappy with her pregnancy and wanted to terminate it. Linda Coffey eventually met with this woman and that woman would become known as Jane Rowe. So Jane Rowe's real name was Norma McCorvey. There's a lot to be said about Norma McCorvey's life and the politicization of her life. But suffice to say, at this time in 1970, when she's meeting with Linda Coffey at a pizza restaurant in Dallas, she's a 23 year old single woman. She lives in poverty. She is struggling with disordered substance use and she desperately does not want to be pregnant. So Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington file a lawsuit challenging Texas's law, which, again, totally prohibited any abortion 
at any stage of pregnancy, except in the instance that it was necessary to save the mother's life. So they filed their lawsuit in Dallas County. And since the district attorney at the time, you know, the, the person who would be enforcing compliance with state law was Henry Wade. Wade was the named defendant. So that's how we get Roe versus Wade. But in terms of how the case gets from district court in Dallas to the Supreme Court, that lower court actually agreed with Norma McCorvey, with Jane Roe and her attorneys. And they said that the Texas law was void. They struck it down. But the court also granted a stay of its order until the appeals process was over. Um, The appeals process and the Supreme Court decision would still take another two years. In the meantime, Norma McCorvey didn't get the abortion care that she had been seeking, and she carried her pregnancy to term and she gave the baby up for adoption. So I think that brings us to some law stuff. (laughs) Yeah, so... The law outlined by Roe v. Wade is actually fairly simple. If you recall, the 14th Amendment's substantive due process clause has been interpreted to protect certain fundamental rights, including a right to privacy. And in Roe, the court holds that that right to privacy encompasses a woman's decision to terminate her pregnancy. So as a result, the court strikes down state laws that function as like near total bans on abortion. Now, This is in many ways a great opinion, but before you read it, you need to firmly situate yourself in the brain of an old white man in 1973. (laughs) Justice Blackman (laughs) writes the majority. Uh, Like Ree mentioned, this is early in his tenure, but he is 64 years old. Yeah. He would ultimately become one of the most persuasive left-leaning voices on the court in history, But even so, uh, these are distinctly different times. So the opinion starts off by describing the plaintiff as a, quote, pregnant single woman, immediately stating her marital status as if it is like (laughs) paramount to understanding her identity and the case. So already you're like, ooh. Yeah, it's like, okay, guys, we're talking about a crazy person here. (laughs) This harlot. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. Blackman is an incredibly good writer, and one of the things he lists as something that might determine or impact your outlook on abortion is, quote, your exposure to the raw edges of human existence, which I thought was very poetic. Uh, (laughs) It's good quality writing, but it's also a little dramatique, right? It is. He loves the drama. He loves the drama. He does. Yeah. And I I do, too. I live for the drama. (laughs) Yeah. An interesting point that Blackman makes is that if you survey the legal history, there wasn't really a consistent stance that you could find on abortion, no matter how far back you go. So there were ancient societies like uh, the Greeks and the Romans, which practiced it very freely. uh, And there were some that punished it a little more aggressively, like the Persians at certain times. And sorry about that, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Apologies from my people to yours. There's no indication that it was like consistently treated as a crime in English common law. Laws in the U.S. concerning abortion, like re mentioned, started to spring up in the 1800s, and laws criminalizing it only show up later in that century. Right. And most of those distinguish between early and late term abortions, albeit in like medically crude terms. It was only over the course of the first half of the 20th century that you start to see these blanket or almost blanket bans on abortion become popular in the United States. And Mm -hmm. this is an important point because it cuts against the core of the broader conservative argument here. Conservatives' reaction to this decision and the, you know, quote unquote, liberal Supreme Court of the mid-century in general is rooted in the idea that the court was comprised of activist judges who were imposing their sort of ivory tower sensibilities on the rest mm-hmm. of us. Yeah. Thereby yeah. sort of disturbing this natural order, right? Disturbing these longstanding practices of the common folk. And this is a theme you see in a lot of conservative jurisprudence, something that someone like Scalia is actually sort of famous for. But here is Blackman pointing out that anti abortion laws, as they exist in the United States at this time, are actually quite novel and new. Right. And that's important because a lot of the criticism of this decision by constitutional originalists is predicated, at least in part, on the idea that like a right to abortion would be sort of unthinkable to the founding fathers. Yeah. Yeah. But what Blackman is pointing out is actually the right to abortion more or less existed at the time of the founding. Uh, Mm -hmm. And this is sort of, you know, something I was 
just talking about on our uh, our guest episode on the Know Your Enemy podcast, this is invented tradition. It's a fictionalized right. version of history designed by conservatives to sort of support their own ends. Yes, exactly. And so because the right to privacy is a fundamental right under the Constitution, the Supreme Court applies strict scrutiny to laws that restrict abortions. Right. Since they're saying this is like a fundamental right, they're imposing the highest form of a scrutiny, like the most exacting form of judicial review, under which uh, most laws don't survive. Like if you subject yeah. a law to strict scrutiny, it's probably going to get struck down, uh, which in turn would make it very difficult for states to continue outlawing or uh, otherwise heavily regulating abortions. Yeah. Right. So the Roe v. Wade ruling establishes what's referred to as the trimester framework. The court is reasoning that the state does have some important interests in restricting abortion access sometimes. And those interests are protecting the health of women and also in protecting potential life. On the other hand, Blackman says, you know, we have this individual right to privacy and women have bodily autonomy. So we have to balance those interests against each other to decide when abortion restrictions are permissible. And the balance of those interests shifts as the pregnancy goes on. So in the first trimester, Blackman reasons that the state's interest in protecting potential life is pretty low because a fetus is not viable in the first trimester of pregnancy. And the state interest in protecting a woman's health at that time is basically non-existent because abortions are extremely safe procedures early in pregnancy, even at this time in the early 1970s. Mm -hmm. Likewise, in the second trimester, like the state's interest in protecting the health of the woman might grow. But Blackman reasons that because a fetus hasn't reached the point of viability, a woman's individual rights still outweigh the state interests. But in the third trimester, this balance shifts and the state has a heightened interest in protecting women's health and they have a heightened interest in potential life because in the third trimester, you know, a fetus is viable. Most fetuses in the third trimester can perform beginner Sudoku uh, (laughs) with some moderate success. That's my understanding. (laughs) Um, In the end, Blackman concludes that states cannot prohibit abortion in the first or second trimesters of pregnancy, but they can in the third trimester. Yeah. So in short, Roe creates a balancing act between the rights of the individual and the power of the state. And that balance shifts more toward the state with each trimester. Right. Especially in the third trimester. And, you know, Blackman definitely did his research like reasonably well here. But there's still something weird about this like male lawyer showing up in the most important women's rights decision in the country's history. Like, okay, so I looked into pregnancy and uh, I got some ideas. You guys heard about trimesters? (laughs) It's nine months. You could divide it into three parts. (laughs) Like, obviously, trimesters are like a useful guidepost, right? They're used by doctors. It's not totally unscientific, but it is imprecise, right? It's not like strictly medical. Obviously, pregnancy is, you know, more of a spectrum than it is three distinct phases. And so, you know, to try to map these like rigid legal standards onto the trimester framework is a little bit imprecise, which is not necessarily a nightmare. Some of that stuff is sort of necessary in the law. Like, Going 56 isn't always more dangerous than going 55, but one of them is breaking the law, right? There, there sort of has to be a line. Right. And maybe this is the, sort of the way to do it, but it does right. feel a little skeezy, I have to say. It, it does feel a little skeezy. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. And I think that comes from, like we said, this is the early 1970s. Right. There are no women on the Supreme Court. Yeah. You can look back into the oral arguments at the Supreme Court and see the tone with which uh, Sarah Weddington, who... Uh, gave the oral argument on behalf of Jane Roe, the tone with which the old white male justices are asking her questions. Mm -hmm. And you get the vibe, right? Um, To give you maybe a sense of the social milieu at the time, (laughs) the (laughs) lawyer representing Texas starts off his argument by saying, quote, it's an old joke, but when a man argues against two beautiful ladies like this, they're going to have the last word, Um, which is (laughs) then met with several seconds of continuous silence from the justices. <laughs> right. God. While the guy like shuffles with his papers and is like, okay, well. Uh... <laughs> yeah, tough crowd tonight. Tough crowd. 
Um, And also, I think this is a result of the sort of multiple drafts that went into the final Roe versus Wade majority opinion. So Blackman circulated among the justices multiple drafts of this opinion, and he took feedback from the other justices. Um, Blackman first wrote the opinion, and he put the cutoff after the first trimester, and he admits that it is arbitrary. He uses the word arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the justices, I don't remember who now, replies that he thinks it should be between the second and third trimester. And so that's why that decision is made. And so, yeah, it's just not a ton of expertise about how pregnancy works. And there's no real incorporation of like, what do women think about this? These guys um, are all old enough that I don't think it's guaranteed they even got sex ed in like high school. Right, or right, whatever. right. Oh, no, definitely not. No, no, no. Their only experience with this is with their wives. Blackman was born in 1908. So imagine what that sex ed was like in like 1921 (laughs) or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) So this case was 7-2. William H. Rehnquist wrote a dissent. And, you know, I read it a few times. Uh, Not to brag. It's only two pages long or whatever. (laughs) Okay, nerd. (laughs) Didn't really take that much. (laughs) And, uh, you know, the more I read it, the more I appreciated it as like an effective piece of propaganda, I think. Like it starts with what feels like some very nitpicky stuff about how uh, it's not clear whether Jane Roe was in her first trimester and therefore whether or not she even had standing to bring this sort of challenge and demand this sort of remedy, which I don't know, we could debate that. But I think the important thing it does is sort of set up and frame this idea that the court is like reaching way outside the record way outside its normal limits um, and framing the entire decision as very activist. Right. And that's what he does. He doesn't write like a persuasive legal argument, I don't think, but he he frames things very well to make this feel very extreme. Like the same facts that Blackman talks about, right. about uh, when laws were first enacted, he takes a completely different meaning from, right? Because he says the first laws regulating abortion are over 100 years old and whatever. Right. He doesn't say what those laws do. He doesn't mention whether or not they allow abortions in the first trimester. He elides all that stuff, but instead characterizes it as like evidence of this rich tradition of controlling women's bodies. Right. It's effective and and I feel like becomes sort of a template for legal arguments about this mm-hmm. going forward. It's very yes. concise and to the point and is sort of like a mission statement for the religious right for the yeah. next few decades. So to refresh a little bit, the 14th Amendment Substantive Due Process Clause protects our liberty and the courts have held that Your right to privacy is one of those fundamental liberties that the Constitution protects. And conservatives like Rehnquist are pushing against this, basically saying it's too much of a stretch. Whereas the liberals have said, look, there are these sort of flexible areas within the Constitution that we should interpret a little more broadly to protect citizens' rights. Yes. And that's where liberals and conservatives are butting heads just on how flexibly this stuff should be interpreted. You know, what sort of liberties is the Constitution protecting? And it's important, I think, to situate it in like the broader conservative academic reaction. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in 1971, Robert Bork, later famous for being denied a spot on the Supreme Court in the 80s, but at this point still just sort of a leading light of of conservative uh, legal intellectuals, publishes an article called Neutral Principles and Some First Amendment Problems, where he lays out the originalist viewpoint, and it's sort of the seminal originalist work. And one of the things he focuses on is the 14th Amendment, which he thinks is out of control. Right. And so, like, the conservatives here are making, like, a very simple argument. They're saying that the court finding a right to privacy and then extending that right to protect abortion is simply too much of a stretch and doesn't have Mm -hmm. much of a basis in the Constitution. And this is when you see conservative lawyers and academics really rally around originalism and the idea of judicial restraint. And conservative politicians are complaining about activist judges. And the timing here is important because I think a lot of people see the merit in the conservative legal argument generally. It does take a small leap to say that the 14th Amendment protects a right to privacy and another leap to say that that right covers abortion. 
I personally don't find the conservative argument very convincing. I think the flexibility of the 14th Amendment is a feature and not a bug. Absolutely. And that the conservatives' criticism is really just reflective of their frustration with that flexibility rather than any sincere Mm -hmm. concern that it's improper or inaccurate. Right. But no matter what you think of their argument in and of itself, I want to highlight what I would consider to be some suspect timing here, right? Mm -hmm. Conservative skepticism about judicial overreach, in particular concerning the 14th Amendment, really hits a fever pitch in the early 1970s. This is immediately after the Warren court relied on the 14th Amendment to broaden voting rights and civil rights and here the right to privacy. And conservatives often couch their concern as almost purely academic. They were claiming to be worried about the improper interpretation of the Constitution. Right. Which is interesting because, like I mentioned earlier in this episode, the Supreme Court used that same vague substantive due process clause of the 14th Amendment to find a right to contractual liberty, meaning the right to enter into contracts freely in 1905. And that ruling just so happened to help big exploitative businesses. And over half a century went by without really as much as a whisper from conservative academics and lawyers on the issue. And yet when the same clause is interpreted to protect the rights of minorities or to protect sexual liberties, conservatives suddenly had like a robust academic objection ready, (laughs) which is to say that the intellectual reasoning proffered by the conservatives is outcome driven. They are not principled academics who believe in the neutral application of the law. They knew they wanted to oppose the expansion of rights for women and for the marginalized more broadly. And they worked backwards from that premise to build an intellectual framework that would do that. This disingenuousness is the foundation of the conservative legal movement. Exactly. It is its beating heart. Totally. Yes. One interesting aspect of the conservatives argument about Roe is that a lot of liberals have actually bought into it. It has become Mm -hmm. a common refrain in liberal legal circles that while the outcome in Roe was good, it would have been a stronger case if it was built on the Equal Protection Clause instead of the idea of a right to privacy. Right. The Equal Protection argument is based on the idea that restrictions on abortion access are centered on or come out of the state forcing women to accept what the state views as the quote unquote natural status of women. It's the state imposing a normative role on women as natural and eventual mothers. And so the Equal Protection Clause protects equality and has been interpreted to mean that freedom from state imposed roles is fundamental to equal citizenship. It's fundamental to sort of closely scrutinize legal burdens that fall unequal equally on members of different groups. And so, you know, for example, Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself, she famously stated that Roe versus Wade should have been decided as an equal protection case rather than a due process case. And she wrote once she was on the court in a different case, quote, legal challenges to undue restrictions on abortion procedures do not seek to vindicate some generalized notion of privacy. Rather, they center on a woman's autonomy to determine her life's course and thus to enjoy equal citizenship stature. Mm -hmm. And also, like in law school, you'll find like Griswold, the progenitor to Roe, disparaged. Its reasoning is like laughed at because it uses words like the penumbras of the amendments and the Constitution. And like people roll their eyes. Right. And liberal professors and liberal law students just are like, well, they know what they're talking about. So they just like believe it. I guess that is a badly reasoned decision. You know. Right. Yeah. I think there's like some interesting academic discussion to be had about whether it would have been more easily defensible to use an equal protection argument, although I'm not particularly sold on that. But there's a misconception that a more intellectually defensible opinion would have been less susceptible to attack by conservatives. And that, to me, fundamentally misunderstands the reactionary project. Right. I highlighted the disingenuousness of the conservative academic position in part because it speaks to a broader truth. No matter how you couched the argument for a right to an abortion, the conservative reaction the conservative opposition was always coming. Yes. Mm -hmm. It would not matter if you made it about a different clause of the Constitution. They are driven by outcomes. Trying to brainstorm a snappy little argument isn't going to get you anywhere. You'll be fighting on a battlefield that doesn't exist because they're not trying to beat you in a real argument. Right. Conservatives don't hate Roe because they are truly concerned with the excesses of a particular mode of constitutional interpretation. They hate Roe because they don't support the right to an abortion. 
It's as simple as that. Right. Exactly. That's right. So uh, we're talking a lot about the 14th Amendment, and rightfully so. But I also want to talk about the Ninth Amendment, because I think it's a good illustration of what Peter's saying about yeah. the bad faith of the conservatives. Yes. Because it's a great example of, you know, no matter how you decided this case, um, they would have come up with some way, no matter how strained, to take issue with it. Right, and exactly. find that you were wrong. Yes. So what the Ninth Amendment says is that the Bill of Rights is not exhaustive, that the people hold other rights. Mm -hmm. Just because a right isn't listed there doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and that the people don't have it. Right. Um, and, and that the government can't infringe those rights. Right. And, you know, there's some debate about what that means or not, but it made an appearance in these cases. In Griswold v. Connecticut, the progenitor to Roe v. Wade, the case that said you have a right to contraception, um, there was a concurrence that said that, you know, this should be decided on Ninth Amendment rather than 14th Amendment grounds. Now, right. these aren't really in conflict. The people who like the 14th Amendment arguments also like the Ninth Amendment arguments and vice versa. Similarly, the district court in Roe v. Wade actually decided it on Ninth Amendment grounds right. in favor of Jane Roe. Right. And the majority opinion in Roe v. Wade says, look, whether you think the right to privacy comes from the 14th Amendment or whether you think it comes from the Ninth Amendment doesn't really matter. The point is that it exists. Exactly. There's a broad agreement here that, you know, if the Bill of Rights is not exhaustive, what might those unlisted rights be? What might they look like? Well, a right to privacy makes perfect sense right. because it seems foundational to all the other rights. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's exactly what conservatives have a problem with and what, you know, just to go back to like what Peter is saying about their bad faith. So, you know, I think a really good example is Robert Bork in his confirmation <laughs> hearings. Yeah. He's asked yes. about what he thinks about the Ninth Amendment and he calls it an ink blot on the Constitution, which <laughs> right. like this is, you know, the preeminent conservative legal thinker who is ostensibly all about like, you know, the words in the Constitution mean things and right, we right. should be, you know, really thinking about the originalist interpretation of the Constitution. And he's literally saying like, nah, I don't I don't pay attention to that amendment. That amendment sucks and I don't like it. Yeah. Right. And somebody asked him how you should interpret it. And he's like the same way you would an ink blot. You, you right, don't just skip it's, over that. Yeah. It's not there. We're not exaggerating when we say they want to write it out of the Constitution. Right. Yeah. They, like literally, you know, it's like the guy in Westwood, you know, it doesn't look like anything to me. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just been edited right. out of their code <laughs> entirely. And it goes back to what Peter was saying about their frustration with the 14th Amendment. It's their frustration that like, look. This opens the door to anything. Right. Mm -hmm. It's their frustration with the flexibility of it and the potential for expansion. Right. Exactly. Of it's fuzzy and it's gray and it's going to involve a lot of judicial discretion right. that will sort of, by definition, reflect changing social values. And that's shit they hate. Right. Absolutely. I think there's like, if you're a law student or a lawyer, you probably heard in law school that Roe v. Wade was a weak decision, right? right? Yes. And the reason yeah. you heard that was almost certainly because conservatives have like won this meta argument about right. the role of judges with respect to the 14th Amendment. Right. Roe v. Wade wasn't incorrectly decided. Roe v. Wade was decided based on a very reasonable understanding of the 14th Amendment, a very reasonable understanding. Right. Yeah. And the conservative development of this framework in which judges are, like said, to have no discretion with respect to the 14th Amendment was in reaction to Roe v. Wade and Griswold v. Connecticut. <laughs> right, exactly. They don't actually believe that judges shouldn't have discretion. They give judges all sorts of enormous amounts of discretion when it comes to aiding the conservative causes. Right. It's, to me, a tremendous feat of the conservative legal movement that they have been able to successfully paint Roe as being incorrect to the degree where, like, liberal students across the country probably give that at least some credence, if not agree right. with it outright. Right. Like in law school, when you're in con law and um, talking about Roe v. Wade or if you're in 14th Amendment or whatever, a very common like a structure to class discussion that day will be like a debate, like which amendment would have been better to justify right. the right to uh, have an abortion, you know, like, should it have been the 14th Amendment? Eh. Well, there are some good arguments for why it should have been the ninth, you know, so right. the extent to which like academics across the political spectrum have uh, bought into what is conservative narrative and conservative politicization of the decision as weak and not grounded in the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, my con law exam had one question was if you got to just write a new amendment and it would be passed, what would it be? And I put a right to privacy and explained like sort of the language in a way that would try to be exhaustive. Yeah. And my reasoning was like, I was like, look, you know, I think Roe v. Wade and Griswold v. Connecticut are fine, but I just want to put all this shit to rest. Right, yeah. right. Shut exactly. them up, like, right? right. It's like, in the constitution, like, shut the fuck yeah. up. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and look, I, I think to wrap this up, like our position on Roe is that it's a well-reasoned case. It is taking something that everyone at the time agreed exists, which is a 14th Amendment protection of liberty, Mm -hmm. applying it to a right to privacy, which is a very small step away from the sort of rights that the Constitution already provides and makes perfect sense in the context of the broader Constitution. And then saying, wouldn't a decision to terminate your pregnancy, which might be one of the most personal decisions you could even conceptualize, fall under a right to privacy, which in my mind is like incontrovertibly true. Right. Um, Slam right. dunk. Like, it is. It is. And yeah. if, if you believe mm-hmm. and you should if you're on the left and I mean, <laughs> frankly, you should believe it if you, across the political spectrum. If you believe that the Constitution provides for any amount of flexibility, then you have to concede that this is a reasonable decision. I'm sorry. Right. Do. Right. And yeah. the consensus among academics, among uh, law school professors that it's incorrect is intellectual cowardice. They've been bowed by the conservative legal movement for 50 years. And it's pathetic. It is. Right, right. And, you know, what just occurred to me is I'm wondering how much the legal movement to expand rights for queer people, um, gay marriage, you know, trans rights, all of it, how much that was likely delayed or stunted because Mm -hmm. liberals bought into this idea that Roe v. Wade was not a strong opinion. Like, it can't be cited as like this really strong precedent because all conservatives do is talk shit about it. But if we had centered these really important personal rights in the 14th Amendment due process clause, there's nothing wrong with expanding that even further for other marginalized groups in the future. But that's not now how those legal arguments are framed. And and even though those cases, the gay marriage cases, for example, were decided on equal protection grounds rather than due process grounds, they're infused with the language of the old right to privacy. Right, cases. Yep, right. They talk about human dignity and exactly. liberty and autonomy and all the stuff the Warren Court was talking about in the 60s and in Roe v. Wade right. in, in the 70s. Yeah. Right. So we could have built on those principles rather than exactly. being on our heels for 45 years. Right, right. Yeah. So we should probably move on because I'm sure we could all just complain about law schools and law professors for hours on end. Forever. <laughs> yeah, I think we got that part. I think you got that uh, covered. So let's talk a little bit about the institutionalization of conservative reaction. At this point in history, in the early 1970s, not only do organizations like the Federalist Society not exist, but there isn't really a jurisprudential framework that conservatives are consistently adhering to. Right. Originalism right. was just starting to gain the attention of right-wing academics and Roe really helps kickstart the project of putting that framework together because now they have a real issue to rally around, a material issue to rally around. And so the conservative legal movement starts to really build steam. And for many of its members uh, and many of the people funding it, priority number one is overturning Roe v. Wade. That's right. And it's interesting because like the religious right is relatively new at that point. It's sort of developed originally in response to the New Deal and this idea of a large godless state. And like Eisenhower took office and he was very religious, but in a way that didn't really help the religious, right? You know, he said the government had to be godly or whatever, but he didn't care what faith, right? (laughs) Right. It's very ecumenical. Like there's a place for Jews, there's a place for Catholics, there's a place for Protestants, whatever, Right. right? Like, and as a result, Democrats and Republicans alike sort of claimed the mantle of religiosity for the next like 10, 15 years. You know, they put one nation under God on the coin and that was like almost nobody voted against that. Right. That was like bipartisan. Right. The cracks really started to show when the religious right tried to get like prayer in school and stuff and they'd lost on that. Right. They couldn't get the majorities they wanted. But after the civil rights movement, you know, the Democrats New Deal coalition that was like a very working class cross-racial coalition started to fracture 
And you have this like big moment of political change where the demographic makeups of the coalitions are shifting and Roe v. Wade becomes this like rallying point, this great cause for the conservative, you know, religious right to rally, especially evangelicals to their cause Mm -hmm. and to cement them in the Republican coalition. Right, right. Uh, So it was a big organizing point for the Republican Party. Right. And something that like Richard Nixon identified and spoke about in the the Nixon tapes, where, by the way, he said that he understood that there might be a limited need to an abortion. And the example he gave was if, quote, a black and a white had a baby. Jesus. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. That's in yeah. the Nixon tapes for real? That's in the Nixon tapes. God damn. And then the person Jesus he was with said, Christ. or rape. And he was like, oh, yeah, or rape. Fuck yeah, yeah. that guy. Everything <laughs> I learn about the man. What a fucking monster. Yeah. yeah. The Ugh. Nixon tapes are a parade of horrors. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, he yeah. was sort of instrumental, uh, and one of the figures, at least, who was instrumental for fusing the broader white reaction with the religious right. Right. And his mm-hmm. his understanding of the importance of the right was integral to positioning it, you know, in a place where it would be able to grow to become what it is now, which is yeah. the center, right. the very center of the Republican Party. Yeah, yeah. And what we're trying to say, I think, is that Roe versus Wade as a Supreme Court decision that comes down in the early 1970s becomes this central cause, like Michael said, around which the right and conservatives in this country sort of coalesce and build new political coalitions. It's a jumping off point for the conservative movement and the conservative legal movement in a lot of respects. So it's new conservative coalitions and institutions building around these bridges between politicians, academics, religious leaders, activists. And they have now this big, beautiful opinion from the Supreme Court around which to rally everybody and sort of have this big shared cause. Right. And you see it in the 80s, too, as we like move past Roe v. Wade, you would think it would start to be in the rearview mirror. Instead, what you have is Ronald Reagan's attorney general, Ed Meese, saying like, look, we need to come out against this. Yes. We need to be making statements mm-hmm. in court criticizing this and asking the court to overturn right. it. And right. you have Reagan talking at the March for Life via telephone. Right. But still, like saying he need, we need to end this national tragedy. Right. Yeah. Right. Although he uh, thought he was just on the phone with a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> She gave him a jelly bean every time he got a line right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, at the March for Life in 1987, which is the one that Ronald Reagan spoke at, Jesse Helms, then a senator uh, from North Carolina, he attended and spoke in person calling abortion, quote, an American Holocaust. So, you know, just to emphasize sort of these coalitions that are being built at the time and, you know, the religious right and politicians being hand in hand in opposition to Roe. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you have over the course of the 70s and 80s, these institutional and cultural forces building momentum on the right and the Republican Party and the conservative legal movement all embracing the pro-life position. You're seeing legislation, right? The Hyde Amendment bans the use of federal funds to subsidize abortion. Uh, Yeah. Reagan makes it part of his platform in 1980. That was the first time that a a Republican had the pro-life position in their platform. Yes. Um, Judges who are more ideologically conservative start to gain prominence during that same era, and conservatives are securing more seats on the Supreme Court. In 1989, there's a case called Webster v. Reproductive Health Services, where the court upheld a law that, among other things, forbade the use of public facilities for abortions unless they were necessary to save a woman's life, and required physicians to perform tests to determine the viability of fetuses after 20 weeks. In 1991, there's a case called Rust v. Sullivan, where the court upheld a ban of abortion counseling and referral by family planning programs funded under the Federal Public Health Service Act. So with the disposition of the court shifting away from protecting abortion rights, conservatives are sort of sensing an opportunity. Right. They've Mm -hmm. been at this point trying for nearly 20 years to overturn Roe v. Wade. And in 1992, they finally get their chance. Bum, bum, bum. Next time on <laughs> 5 to 4. We'll be talking about that <laughs> in part two, baby. Come back to part two. 
So in part two, we will talk about Planned Parenthood v. Casey, how it plays out, and how the subsequent nearly 30 years have involved the slow dismantling of abortion rights across the country by the Supreme Court. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter at 54pod. Buy our merch. Tell your friends. 5-4 is presented by Prologue Projects. This episode was produced by Katja Kumkova with editorial oversight by Leon Nafok and Andrew Parsons. Our artwork is by Teddy Blanks at Chips NY, and our theme song is by Spatial Relations. Mm-hmm.